uh, just to be more dramatic. Uh, but yeah, so so your time at Ameriflight was relatively short, wasn't it? About a year. Yeah, uh, it was about a year, and uh, that is because I had the opportunity to go do something else uh, after the fact, and that is the flight school. Um, and uh, I started the flight school while I was still at Ameriflight. I was commuting weekly between Aguadilla, Puerto Rico, and uh, New York, and it was very challenging because I would fly Monday through Friday at the airline. Uh, Friday night, I would head home for two hours, change, repack, and then head back to the airport to start a uh, what, what sometimes would be a 13 to 16 hour commute because I would have to three leg it. Uh, we didn't have the appropriate reciprocal agreements at the time. So it was very tough. And, um, as the flight school started to grow and as things started to, uh, to progress, I, it was time to make it end and pick one or the other. Yeah. And, and tell us, how does someone start a flight school? I mean, I have a little bit of experience in that. Uh, and I chose not to because, I felt for myself, the risk was too high because I was going in really with a partner, but the financial burden was going to fall all on me. And as a a flight instructor, I just couldn't do it. How did you start it? Uh, Really good story. I recently, we put out a a video on uh, on my YouTube channel. It's uh, the Kareem Shaheen and um, explaining kind of how that process happened because a lot of people have that question. And in the aviation industry, it's very difficult to, uh, a start a flight school and B make sure it succeeds. Um, I had a former student of mine, a former client, and he was much older than I was. He calls me out of the blue. He says, Hey, can you meet me up in New York? I want to talk to you about an opportunity. I fly up to New York. There was a 1970, 1987, uh, Cessna 172 waiting for us. And he said, Oh, I just bought this airplane. We flew over to, um, I think it was Oxford, Connecticut. We had a lunch flight and he said, um, I want to start a flight school and I want to do it with you. You seem to know everybody at the airport. You seem to have the experience. I know you're young, but you're very driven. And I've always expressed that I was interested in business when I was, when I was this flight instructor. Uh, so that was kind of the, the gist of it and, and how we, uh, we did that. We would meet in between my, my Ameriflight job and, uh, and my days off and, we essentially created a list. We compiled a list of the things we didn't like about other flight schools uh, from image. One of the biggest things that really annoyed me was customer service at flight schools because there was a pilot shortage and flight schools, uh, I guess, because there was a pilot shortage and there was very high demand for pilots and a lot of these schools were pilot mills, they didn't believe in customer service. You'd go in there and you'd feel like you were an employee rather than a customer. And I had a big problem with that. I didn't believe that any customer, if you're paying money, you should, you should be treated very nicely, not just fair, but very nice. Uh, so that was one of the things that we wanted to change. Uh, also image, we talk about image all the time and we wanted to, uh, give off this very luxurious, very clean, very modern high end flight school. So the comparison, when people come into our office for the first time, they say, wow, this is like an Apple store. And that was, uh, another goal. And, um, in business, you've got to have one of three things if you want it to succeed. You've got to be the first, you've got to be the most unique, or you've got to be the cheapest. And we were certainly not the first to open a school. We're not going to be the cheapest, but we were going to be the most unique. And that's uh, that's how we did it. Yeah. And it's really inspiring to hear that you were able to kind of flip this into such a successful uh, business, really. Um, and how Did that take a lot of time out of your flying? It took a lot of time, and that's ultimately why I had to quit uh, flying for Ameriflight. At one point, at the beginning stages, when we were a smaller school with a limited fleet, limited, but we didn't quite have the name, uh, I was the instructor, I was the director of operations, I was the chief flight instructor, I was everybody. And it was brutal, because I was flying 120 hours a month, 100 hours a month, and shuffling the office work, and, and that tends to be a hard thing. But again, if you want a business to succeed at the beginning, it's it's very difficult, it's very tough, but everybody's capable of it. Anybody with a, a great brain or just uh, uh, just a functioning brain is capable of doing the same thing I did. You just have to push forward. We, I had obstacles. I mean, because I was young, we had competitors that were very envious and very upset that uh, it was myself and my partner involved. And we dealt with threats. We dealt with fire. We dealt with just a lot of nonsense. Um, and it was it, it truly was a very difficult thing to uh, to navigate. But you learn to deal with it. You learn to live with it, and um, you learn to be tough. And as long as you come off as tough, and you come off as 
hey, you can't bully me around, uh, you tend to do pretty well. Um, and then from there, uh, you can only make so much money off of a flight school. Flight. It's very difficult to make a flight school profitable. So we said, okay, well, we have to do a, a few things different. Uh, number one, we have to keep evolving and keep uh, progressing and becoming unique. So we eventually started painting our aircraft the same color. We incorporated a call sign that the uh, that I negotiated with the air traffic control facilities that were nearby. So we have a call sign agreement. Um, and then from there, we opened up the maintenance shop and the avionics shop, and we just expanded from there. We partnered up with uh, Avidine. We do uh, all of that. And that's truly why the school continues to succeed even during this pandemic. Yeah. And are you seeing uh, an influx of student pilots? I've, I've spoken with a few flight schools here in Southern California, and they indicated to me that they're actually increasing their their flight operations because yeah. a lot of the students that were going to an aviation college, taking classes, taking a few lessons here and there, since their college uh, classes are now mostly online, their schedules have opened up and they're, they're really taking to the skies of GA mm -hmm. uh, much more. Are you seeing that as well? Absolutely. At, at the beginning stages of the pandemic, we saw a little bit of a decrease and then it just started going up. And um, I think the reasons are exactly what you just said. But in addition to that, people have a lot of free time on their hands and people are like, OK, well, I have to make a change. I have to make a career change and I've always wanted to fly. So this is the time to do it. This is the time to do it. And I, I, I think that's why it's it's picking up a little bit. So it's, it's kind of funny. You'd expect it to go down, but it, it actually did the opposite. Yeah. And I've flown with a few pilots out on the flight line. And, you know, when you've been a, an airline pilot at a legacy carrier for the last 20, 25 years, unless on the side you're, you're still involved in GA or still involved with something else, you have a tendency to kind of lose sight of the evolving nature of our industry. And I can't tell you how many times I fly with pilots and they're like, I'm not letting my kids get in aviation. Forget it. They're just, there's, there's going to be a, a pilot and a dog in the cockpit in the future. And the dog's just going to be there to bite the hand of the pilot that does the wrong thing. And the, and the pilot's there to just to, <laughs> to keep the dog from peeing on the carpet. You know, it's like, wait, wait, what? <laughs> what are you saying? This is a great time to get into aviation because now that there's this lull that is temporary, we all agree it's a temporary lull. Now's the time to get in there, get your flight training, get your, get your hours up so that when the hiring begins, the goal of any seniority-based industry is to get in, like you said, in business, first get in at the, at the beginning of the hiring boom i was fortunate enough to get in in the beginning of the hiring boom thanks to rob really who was like hey man come on over to sandpiper because we're going to be hiring i think it was 600 in in 06 or, or 700 in 07 that's what it was so i got on in december of 06 and i was the first class to have more than like 10 people in it i had 47 people in our class. They had to borrow chairs and tables from other classrooms uh, at Sandpiper. And because of that, my career has been very successful. I didn't sit reserve, but a few months when I first started out, I upgraded in a relatively fast pace compared to what it was years earlier. And it was because I was fortunate enough to get in at the beginning of that hiring boom. And I think you have to look at that and go back and go, okay, how am I going to time this correctly? How am I going to get my foot in the door at the right place at the right time with the right company? And I think it all starts of deciding to fly when it's not very popular to do so because the industry is in a cyclical downturn, which obviously we yeah. are. We're in the most destructive aviation uh, downturn since 1970s, yeah. um, since deregulation. So yeah, I, I got my private September 9th, 2001. <laughs> that says anything. <laughs> it's so, sometimes it's good to go against the tide. I think yeah. probably every major thing I've done in my life has been against the advice of others. Um, not, that's not because I'm a rebellious person, but it's because you got to trust your gut. Um, uh, one of those things was becoming a pilot. First and foremost, at the time, nobody wanted to be a pilot. I would go to LaGuardia airport and meet up with these regional pilots and they'd say, don't do it go be a doctor, go be a lawyer, go do something else. Um, choosing the airline that I'm currently at right now, at the time, uh, the pay wasn't great when I was uh, first applying. People didn't really want to be there. The upgrade times were a little high. But I saw 
the future. I was looking at the facts. I was looking at how things were changing. And I said, no, I'm going to go there. And I'm glad I went there when I did because uh, my timing has been superb and I'm in great shape right now because of it. Um, starting a flight school, I can't tell. I think even my folks, everybody said, don't do it. They said, don't start a flight school. It's a very risky thing to do. They never succeed. They never win. You'll be out of business within a year. I had people that owned flight schools telling me this. Um, but I truly believe that if I stick to my gut and I stick to the plan and I, I discussed the plan earlier, then we would be just fine. So uh, don't be discouraged because other people tell you it's not going to work in any aspect of life. Uh, sometimes people's information, the information's outdated. They're uneducated. They're envious. They just don't know. And they think they know. Um, and, and age doesn't necessarily dictate that either. So just trust your gut, do what you think is right. If it's on paper, it's kind of like math. Math doesn't lie. If it's on paper and it makes sense, just do it. Yeah. If you're, if you're truly dedicated, you won't let a few people to dissuade you from doing it, do it. Um, I have, we, I think we've told this story in a previous episode where, you know, I had a, a, a supervisor in my previous career, who was trying to become a manager and he, he interviewed and didn't get it. And he was just completely deflated. And I said, well, if that's all it took for you to be deflated, then they made a good decision when they didn't hire you. Because if you really truly wanted it, you wouldn't let one no stop you. And I think that, like you said, it, it holds true for every industry, for every career, for every passion, for every art, for every sport, you know, don't let a defeat define you and who was it that said you gotta you get hit you get knocked down and you gotta keep on getting up and keep on hitting i think that was rocky balboa yeah, Sylvester <laughs> i think i said the same thing once or twice too so <laughs> I'll, sure I'll, take credit credit for it. I'll take credit <laughs> yeah. excellent yeah. well so how did that transition work you were you were head you know first into this business and yet you still found the time and the opportunity to gain employment at Sandpiper, the, the company name that we use, the alias that we use here on the show to obviously protect you, protect us and, and everyone else because we don't represent those companies as the disclaimer at the, at the beginning of the podcast indicates. But So we use Sandpiper as an alias for those that may be thinking, what? From Wings? Yeah, from Wings. Um, how did you progress into getting a job there? Did you just apply one day and said, yeah, it's time? I applied at uh, two airlines at the time. And it was uh, at that point, the two airlines were very, very similar. They were both subsidiaries. And um, the decision was essentially who's going to get me in first and where am I going to be based? And I obviously wanted to be based in New York because that's where the school was. That's where I lived at the time. Uh, so that's, that's kind of how that happened. I was still doing the flight school but the school started becoming self-sustained at the time. We brought on instructors. My business partner uh, had it figured out. So I was in a position where I was able to move on, do something else. Um, I, at the time, I didn't quite want to go to the airlines anymore. I think I had my, my headset on business and just developing and, and just going from there. Uh, but I had a friend that was at Sam Piper and is now uh, at a legacy carrier. And uh, he said, if you don't do it now, you're going to regret it. And he was absolutely right. The, the timing couldn't have been any better. Um, and had I waited even two months, I'd be in a totally different position now. Uh, so this is the portion of the interview that I like to ask a couple questions. They're not like quick response questions. They're just trying to kind of get your expertise on some of the questions that are often brought to me and often brought to, to all of us here through our listeners um, either from our website or through emails or social media. Can, can I just interject here for, yeah. for, for one second? And, and you can feel free to cut this out, but I'm, I'm a little, on behalf of myself, I'm a little concerned for some of our listeners because I'm feeling pretty insignificant right now um, compared to, to Kareem. I'm, I'm blown away. I'm, you know, and, and Captain Tony, you know, you always have excellent guests, and I'm sure that you choose these people for this reason. However, I have to, I, I have to admit to to the rest of our listeners out there, like myself, if if myself and Rob and and Captain Rob can do it, anybody can do it. You, yeah. you do not need to take a train by yourself across Long Island to get to go to school, or or join the Civil Air Patrol, or or join all these things and wear suits at such a young age. 
Um, you, if you pick one or two of those things, that's great. Kareem here is an exceptional young man <laughs> and an exceptional aviator. Unbelievable. However, I cannot Absolutely. stress enough that for the rest of us mere mortal people, like specifically myself and Captain Rob, that, uh, that anybody can do it. And I don't want any of us to scare anybody out there away who's thinking about <laughs> having a career in the airlines and being shied away because of the, um, quite frankly, I'm blown away, Kareem, by um, the, totally. the fortitude of everything that you've been able to do. But uh, for our younger listeners, <laughs> yeah, this yeah. is this is a great <laughs> career, and it is possible to do it with, with without um, without going through the the enormous um, self control and and self sacrifice that that uh, our man Kareem has has obviously done. And my hats off to you. In all sincerity, my hats off to you, Roger. I don't think that. that's true. I don't think that's true at all. I think you beat me because you had that bird strike and you're on other people's YouTube videos. So I, I, I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say that, that extraordinary. Wrong place, and, and, wrong, wrong time is pretty much all I can say for mine. I didn't have much choice in any of you that. You kept it was just your reaction. cool. Your reaction. That, that's all I can cool. say. Uh, I'm going to call I, Roger I, I'd, I'd the lone survivor. <laughs> <laughs> he is a lone survivor of that. The uh, lone survivor, a seven-pound freaking uh, pterodactyl gizzard. Grape. What was it? What was that bird called? Western grape. Or Western something? grape. And maybe that, it, it, like, I, and like I said, maybe that story go, does go to sh does go to show that a, a normal person can still be a pilot and be successful totally. at it, yeah. and and not have to take a, a three-hour round-trip train ride by themselves across New York yeah. in high school. I, yeah, well, and, I have, and, and I have one. If, if I. If I might, if I might add, um, <laughs> these were at the time and, and look for, for the younger listeners at the time, I didn't know I would, I would be here in 2020. I didn't know that we'd ha you know, I, I would end up starting a flight school. I didn't know that I would be a flight instructor right out of school. I didn't know any of that. I didn't know. And, and, and these weren't goals. It's not like I sat there sitting in bed at the age of uh, 10 uh, and, and saying, oh, well, I'm going to do this on December of 2020. And I would do this and I would do we that. We thank not you for all. your modesty. Yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> it's, 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 you just, you just, you take whatever opportunity comes up. I yeah. promise you, everybody, you, you, the four, the, the three gentlemen here, in addition to myself and all of you, you're going to have opportunities come up in life. They just happen. I didn't come from an aviation family. I didn't come from an aviation background, but the opportunities present themselves. Your, your objective at that point should be to take the opportunity and stretch it out it's kind of like pizza dough and that's not just an analogy because i'm from brooklyn new york but you take the pizza dough <laughs> and you stretch it out as much as you can until it tears that's what you what everybody should be doing in anything in life if you just do that and you take every opportunity sometimes someone would invite me out when, when i would be in, in middle school they'd say hey come out to the airport uh, i'm flying my citation jet in. and i'd be like oh, i have to take a train three hours to go look at a citation jet but 13 year old me at the time was very excited to do that. And I wanted to do that. So I would do it. I would build a, a, a relationship. I'd make a new friend and that friend down the line somehow uh, would end up uh, helping me. So that that's really what it is. Take every opportunity to make new friends, to make new mentors, accept the help, ask questions. It's okay. You might not agree with the answer and you don't have to take it to heart, but ask a lot of questions. And like I said earlier, I would ask questions, people would give me answers, and I wouldn't necessarily implement, but I would use the knowledge and say, okay, well, maybe that was okay five years ago, but it's not okay now. So it's, it's just take every opportunity. And again, you, as Roger said, you don't have to do any of the stuff I did. You could very simply yeah. just go to a part 61 flight school, six months, you're out the door and you're building flight time and you're at an airline. Totally that's, fine too. That's all great advice. I said the same thing, you know, you will have those opportunities and that's pretty much what I did. Take the opportunities that you're given. And, you know, like you had said, go with your gut, go with, take those opportunities, go with your gut and just see them through. And, and if you do those two kind of very basic principles, anybody out there um, can, I truly believe can become a pilot. Yeah, very true. And, you know, and Roger's relatively modest as well, because, you know, we don't really dive into what he's done uh, other than the basic aviation stuff. But I mean, Roger's run the flight school and the, and the flight operations and, and he's done a, quite a bit up uh, in a part owner in, uh, what was it? Part 91, uh, private or corporate style operation. I and have. he's, he's an investor. Roger is an investor. Don't, don't let him kid you. Um, so he's being modest too. Uh, but you know, Kareem, your, your story is absolutely 
impressive and amazing. Yeah, and, and you guys are right. You don't have to climb the mountains that you have climbed and the opportunities you've seized to, to be a part of this industry. But I think what's so wonderful about your story is that it is inspiring that you took that, that grit, that New York grit and said, you know what? Yeah, that's a great opportunity. Uh, yeah, let me try that. And, you know, and hey, and you put yourself out there and people see that. And that is, yep. I think, what has led to such success at a young age because you're in your 20s and you're like, I know people that are in their 70s getting ready to retire and have not accomplished as much as you have. So yep. my hat's off to you. And that's and that's really the whole point here is that we we absolutely applaud you for your tenacity, your, your drive, because without those things, uh, you know, a lazy, a lazy pilot that just likes to sit around and drink beer and eat chicken wings. And, and <laughs> yeah, come on, Roger. No, uh, you know, they're going to like, well, I'll just show up, do my job. Cause that's, you know, yeah. what they tell me to do. And I'm going to fly the plan and it's not my job to do go the extra mile. Actually it is. And the only person you hurt when you have that mentality is yourself because yep. you close those doors. And if, I, if I might add, um, the, the things that I've done in, in my life uh, were not necessarily to become an airline pilot. They're not limited to just aviation. Um, I have interests outside of aviation and I have many goals outside of aviation. All of these events that have taken place from middle school, high school have all just been experienced. I've made a lot of mistakes. I've burnt bridges. I've made those mistakes. I've lost friends. I've made those mistakes. And with every passing opportunity, with every passing experience, just comes more and more good knowledge, good experience, and very tough lessons to learn. Um, so, yeah, I mean, all of this has just been a, a life adventure for uh, for just overall just rounding myself as a person and in, in, in my life and my career, even past aviation, well past aviation. We're going to hear more about Kareem's amazing journey right after the break. <laughs> 